I moved to LA just because I wanted to get out of Michigan, personally, because I just knew it wasn't for me. Um, and I had the luxury of having my grandfather here, my mom's side of the family, but also, you know, Dave, who was a huge part of, I've known Dave since I was four, maybe, and is one of my dad's closest friends. So I, I knew I had like a, a net out here, some sort of network to fall back on, or maybe it made my parents feel more comfortable. I don't know what it was at that time. Well, first off, I came out here, I was working at a gym, had no aspirations really to do anything in music, and Dave needed help at, the, at his vocal studio. So, um, I was there doing basically tedious office work that anybody could have done just to help Dave out, but also make some money. And um, he had an artist come in, this girl named Esme, who was signed to Tenman Records, which was Justin Timberlake's label through Interscope. Um, they brought her in because she was recently signed. She recorded and was in the process of finishing her album, they brought her into Dave to work with her, get a right for, for live performances. And uh, they said, we gotta get her out, you know, doing some little shows here and there before kind of the world sees her. So we need to do it under like a pseudo name and everything. Cause she was like a big YouTube girl. She was used to singing clearly this amazing big voice, uh, her performing, she wasn't used to that. So they needed to have her go through the paces and get her like longer 10,000 hours. So they were talking about it. I overheard a conversation about how they needed to book her in small places. Uh, we need to figure that out, figure out who wants to do that. And I said, well, I, I can do it. Like I can, I don't even know why I said it. Like I, I hadn't never booked anyone before. And I volunteered, I go, well, yeah, seemingly like how, how difficult could that be? There's a million music venues in LA, seemingly every night of the week there's open. You don't need it to be a big show. You just want her in front of people. Naveen and Ken said, yeah, sure, okay, if you wanna do it. Basically like asking Dave if that was a good idea. Dave like gave me the go ahead and I started booking her. Like we did five nights a week. I created this name, uh, name uh, Sandy James. Um, if it's a restaurant, started calling restaurants, going you sometimes have people sing. I don't care if they're there for the music or not. Like just let her, we'll bring our own things. You don't need to pay us, anything like that. Cause that's all that they cared about. They just wanted her out there four to five times a week. So we did that for like, gosh, like three months. When I would go first, just I was there just because I set it up to make sure that things would go right, but I'd heard the songs a million times, so I wasn't paying attention. Then when they asked me to like, well, how'd it go? What do you think? I started looking, like I started paying attention to how it seemed like she was doing, how read the room, how the audience took it in. Um, Cause it's tough to go to a place that they're not there to hear you, hear you sing, right? So you have to win them over. And um, once I started kind of looking at it like that, I couldn't believe that I never had seen it like that. All the different elements that go into what a performance is, what makes a good one, what makes a bad one, what makes a forgettable one, what makes a memorable one. And seeing then an artist that I started to become really close with her, because we, we were together for three months, at almost every night of the week and seeing her, all the stuff she had to go through. Again, this is still foreign to me. I was, I've been to shows all my life when I was little and backstage, everything. I, I never acknowledged it. it was too close to me where it, it didn't seem cool. So I wasn't really even paying attention. I was there for the snacks in the dressing room or I was there, whatever. To understand now, that's a nerve wracking thing, right? To go in front of a room full of people, even if it's 10 people, it's actually worse, it seems like for artists, right? much more intimidating than 30,000 people because you just can't pick a face out of the crowd at that point. Also at that time realizing, boy, they're putting a lot behind her. I mean, these were major writers on that album. So I was thrown into this like, okay, they're putting all of it behind her because they passed on somebody else that I thought I was blown away by as well. This was the big deal for them. This was their first major artist that could be they were gonna put him on the road, her on the road with huge, huge acts as supporting. You couldn't have told me that she wasn't gonna work. Mm -hmm. I was like, you spent how much money on this album and her music videos? Again, Justin gave her like two singles featured on there. They had Gaga wrote on one of them. Ryan Tedder had several. All, Pull of the Dawn was producing and that was when he was, it was like, I couldn't understand how that wouldn't 
have worked, right? And then watching it get fumbled and not handled in the way that maybe it could have or should have or whatever, I was like, wow, I, I, I already don't know if I like this, like the model, the business model of, of a label. And it was perfect because it was right around the time that it seemed like things were starting to shift anyways. I just came around at a good time. The internet is starting to become a thing. No one's at the Viper Room on Wednesdays trying to find the next talent. Like they're actually starting to look on YouTube. So you need to have everything right. You need your performance, your music, look, everything. For whatever reason, I started really liking being with the artist and going through that like Groundhog Day feel where it's the same thing every single day. I still like that. But I started working with other artists that, were, um, that Dave was working with as well. They were like, hey, Elliot can book you shows because I started going, yeah, yeah, I can totally do that. And then if you want me to be there, if you want me to capture it on camera, we can watch it after. Like it started to develop a thing where I had a few artists that, not even that I really believed in or not, it was just, it was goes, this is fun. This is great. I'll work with any, like I can, I can go do this and I can make a little bit of money and I love being around it. I started to develop relationships with the people at the venues. It was, it was so, it was unreal to me because it was so new. And it just felt like, this is something I'm good at. I can do this. Like, and I can, I, I started, I was in rooms with people that were way more experienced, hugely successful. And for some reason I just felt like, yeah, I can, I have no business being here, but I'm here and somehow I'm like getting by. Like nobody's like pulling my card to like ask my resume, right? I'm just here and I'm able to speak and also seeing like, because we were working with Justin's label, that was, he was on the road. It was the Future Sex Love Sound Tour. So watching that from behind the scenes and traveling, we went with them a few shows. I'd never seen such a massive experience. This was this traveling circus to the highest degree I've ever seen. This was, he was at the, the peak. He was the biggest artist in the world at that point. And I couldn't believe how cool it was to watch and start to know these people, the background singers, the band, the dancers, seeing Justin. Like, it was like, I couldn't fathom it. This felt like unbelievable to me. So I was like, I gotta figure out how to be a part of this. There was a decision made to move my brother out with me, move him out from Michigan. Um, he felt the same way I did about Michigan. It just wasn't for him, right? It was, uh, he had, something bigger he wanted to do. Even at that time, it wasn't known. He was 14, maybe turning 15. Michigan wasn't for him. So I was like, all right, get the hell out of there. You come live with me. And um, there, was no, there was no talk about music at all yet. He came, he lived with me. And all of a sudden, he, one day he said, uh, I want to, you know, to make music and I was like all right cool like we've got a laptop like we've got you know that'd be that'd be awesome and then he started showing me like I came back home from work one day and he had a few of these like what we deemed as songs at that juncture um just like starts and I was like whoa okay well this is good like what you know not surprised but kind of surprised I guess and and I was like okay well cool, we'll do this. You don't need to go get a job then. Like just, but if you're going to do this, you got to do it. I won't make you go to a job. I'll, you know, I'll work and everything like that. But when I come home, I got to see what you're working on. You know, you got to do this. You can't just sit around. And we grew up mainly, you know, both of us, but he was super influenced by, um, Lil Wayne is like our favorite rapper artist of all time. There was a year he released like 170 songs. Uh, scattered through mixtapes free so my brother is a product of somebody like him being six and a half years my junior he comes from the space of not knowing what it's like to buy music right it was all for free it was uh, limewire kazam napster everything right there was a bunch of these like hip-hop rap blogs so let's keep let's do every two weeks let's do like seven songs seven song mixtapes and we did that for a year and a half. It's a lot. It's a lot, a lot, a lot. Like his, his pace is, I, I've never seen anything like it. And 
I dare someone to, to challenge his work ethic because of the genre that he's in. And we started shooting little videos too, little, our little handheld stuff. And this was right around the time that like Mac Miller was rising. And so there was this sort of wave of internet white boy rap, but also my brother was not the happy-go-lucky artist. He grew, we grew up listening to Cash Money and No Limit and all this down south rap. So it was very different. Was Bone Thugs, Three Six Mafia, all that. So people were fascinated by the juxtaposition of how he looked and the content and the, how he sounded, all that stuff. Uh, well, we started, he used to go by uh, that kid because we were like, well, who's that kid? T-H at sign K-I-D. And so, again, it didn't take long for like blog sites to start posting him. Again, wasn't big ones, but he all of a sudden was in there when they'd make a post, like he would be towards the top of the popular posts amongst, you know, bigger artists. And so it didn't, I feel like it doesn't take much for people to give you, to like pour more gas on the fire to go, this is actually cool and we're going to make this something. This was before SoundCloud was existing. My brother was, and two of our guys on our collective, were the first 50 artists that ever put their music up on SoundCloud where they reached out, flew out to us, wondering who we were, why were we getting this traction because we weren't with a label and they started, we were like, again, in that first factual, first 50 artists that ever got paid off of SoundCloud. And, um, but it was Mediafire at that time, right? And we were just like, God, okay, so, if there's 300 downloads, maybe there's 10 people in LA, you know, who would want to see a show? We just started asking, right? And eventually you start on Facebook. That's where it was. And so it was, uh, come to Chicago, come to uh, Texas, come to wherever. We were like, you know what, let's build this online until there is a legitimate demand and the first shows you'll ever do are people that know your songs. It, we went up on sale. It sold out the small rooms where they moved us upstairs, bunch of people, you know, all of a sudden there was like a line around the block. And a line at that time at that venue is like 75 people, okay? We couldn't believe it. It, it might as well have been the Staples Center. Like it was like, holy smokes. This is, and it was like $10 a ticket or something like that, but we couldn't believe it. Couldn't, couldn't believe it. That was it, that was enough. It gave us the gas to go. Like it was like, okay, he started getting reached out to by certain other internet rappers. That's what I want to call them, right? He was still a video guy. He was doing, he edits all of his own videos still to this day, um, whether he shoot, you know, whether I shoot it or someone else shoots it. Um, and so some artists were coming in for Coachella and they reached out to him because he was shoot, we shot all of our early videos on a, a legitimate VHS camera. It wasn't an effect, it wasn't anything. Uh, it was a Sony Hi8 and, um, he got asked to come and shoot some videos for some of these artists. And so he did that. Even, and then they realized he could do music and they were like, wait, dude, you never fucking said this. Like, you never told us that. And he connected with some of these guys and felt connected personally, but also liked them musically. So I had them stay with me instead of going back to Memphis after Coachella. And it, all of a sudden it was like, wow, this is happening. There are, three of them are here. They're recording in my garage. Pictures started to go out on the internet of all of them together. And for whatever reason, all their, the fans just freaked out that they were all together. Somehow they liked all of them individually, right? Uh, Xavier Wolf, who went by Eat the Wolf by, back then, and then a, a guy named Chris Travis and Eddie Baker. And so we had this little factory going on at my house. But we honestly didn't even start thinking about that. Like that wasn't even a thing. We just knew we were doing something that seemed really, really cool and people started to take notice. And if you find the right, it's, it's all about finding the right partner, right? And the person that believes in it and that is, again, gets to detail. Mm -hmm. If I ask you what, what the song is and why you like the song, you better be able to tell me what it is and why you like it. Don't go, don't be general and bland with me. Cause now I know you haven't really done your research. Someone brought the name up. You call us in, you want to figure this out. However, they'd all taken label meetings. It rubbed them the wrong way. So they go 
F it, we're, we're going, we're gonna do this by ourselves. And I go, yeah, yeah, let's go. I'll, I'm gonna start booking things. I started asking on Twitter. I said, guys, ask everyone, where are you listening from? Okay, we have 80 people in Milwaukee. Where do you go to shows at? They said the venue. I had the tweet at the venue. By the time I reached out to the venue, they'd already been alerted on social media, right? And so they go, got it, yeah, I saw, it. everyone was hitting us up about this two days ago. I was like, we'll rent the van, put together a, you know, at that time it was like a 12 city tour, which felt like massive at that time. And we went around, we all stayed in the same room at a Motel 6, ate McDonald's, and we're in heaven because we were going around city to city. That first tour, the capacity maybe 250, it was packed. But also the energy, because the, the guy's music uh, is energy. We had our versions of like mosh pits at these shows. And if this isn't standing around bobbing your head hip hop, maybe also to help with ego, one person was not gonna go ahead of another. The four of them were gonna tag team it all, right? So I go, okay, Eddie, pick a song or two. Zay comes in, Xavier does two songs. Elmo comes in, does two songs. Chris comes in, does two, two songs. So it's, it's, it's constant. There is no one set. We're performing for an hour and 30 to an hour and 40 minutes total. It's not, not like Eddie's doing 15 minutes, then Xavier's doing 15 minutes, and this. Let's just go. It was exhilarating. I loved every second of it. The guys were all so close. So seeing that on stage, I recognized how special that was. Very few people go to shows alone, right? So you go with a group of friends, especially our genre. It's like six of them in high school show up and they see, oh, these guys are, they're boys too and they're all doing it together. They all would go, wouldn't, wouldn't this be incredible? We can do that. So in LA, nobody really wanted to give us a chance to perform at a legitimate venue. An all ages rap show was really like looked at as, they're not gonna make money at the bar because everyone's smoking weed, no one's, no one's drinking. Um, it's, it, it, it was aggressive. They saw clips of our shows and it looked aggressive. So nobody really wants to take a chance on that. And also we weren't big enough yet to do 700 or whatever. It's like 500 people. So I rented out a warehouse, rented sound equipment, loaded it in our SUV. We went and set up our own thing. I hired private security to my wife, my parents were at the door, we sold merch. Um, and next thing you know, we had 1,500 kids lined up around the block in like Compton and there was helicopters flying over and the police were shutting us down. We had all the kids go back to their cars. I called another friend of a venue, a warehouse that I was gonna book. He was available, I booked that one we tweeted out the new address and it was chaos and they all went over. And in an hour, we packed up the van and we got over there. That was to me like the turning point of when that happened. And I noticed it when it was happening. Like it's like it was yesterday. I knew it was happening because it felt like electric. After the warehouse stuff, that brought attention to everybody. All of a sudden, Live Nation, Golden Voice, everyone wanted to meet with me to figure out, well, you gotta do, I mean, again, we're pulling a bunch of people more than the artists that you have playing your venues that have radio hits to come out. So they offered me to do a show at the House of Blues on Sunset, which is no longer there, but a legendary venue. Okay. And the, what they offered me was lower than what we made on our warehouse show. Because I go, mm, okay, well, I don't wanna do that. That doesn't make sense but I knew I had them already. They showed me their hands. So I said, well, you rent it out for private part, private events, right, don't you? I said, yeah, but not on Fridays or Saturdays. Those are for shows. I said, no, all right, no problem. How much is it to rent it out? They gave me the cost. I rented it out for a Wednesday. Uh, we sold it out. They couldn't believe it. And so the industry's small, as all of you guys know, like, and that started to get around. And all of a sudden, because it's LA, all of a sudden I go, well, why, are, why is there 15 comps for these people that, like if I'm renting out the venue, these label people are showing up. They're asking to come in the green room. They're meeting the guys and the guys don't care. And that added to the allure, you know, where Fader Magazine came out and did this huge article and it was like, you know, bigger people started to reach out 
and this was when like ASAP Rocky was really, really big and he publicly said how much he, you know, supported my brother and he wanted to do something with him. And it was like, you know, again, it takes a couple of those things. And then we started really, because of my relationships with people, was able to go, okay, well, Golden Voice, we'll give you a chance to do our Texas shows. So we'll go do four Texas shows with you in beautiful big venues. So it wasn't the van anymore. It wasn't the Motel 6. It was a tour bus and nice hotels and we could eat at a restaurant if we wanted as opposed to McDonald's, right? Again, it's such a privilege like to like genuinely go out there because people can still support our music without really paying anything because the music is free. But also we've always said, buy a piece of merchandise or buy a ticket to a show. At least you get something in return for that. And that's why we've been able to build like a really strong, loyal fan base to where our merchandise sells out. We do, you know, five to 7,000 pieces of merchandise a month just for my brother. And we have our own warehouse. We, our fulfillment center is our family and friends uh, that we've hired to do that. And it's like, it still hasn't felt too much different. And that's also why I think it's, it's worked. And I think that, um, because we still have the same people around us. It still feels like me and Elmo putting this together, delivering a project 24 hours before it's out for the world to hear. There's no other hands that are involved in this, but we have, for us, we have found a, a distribution partner who has allowed us to do our thing. They don't get in the way, we just use them for distribution, but also they allowed us to go, we believe that you guys can find talent as well. So they gave us our own imprint to be able to do with what we want, provide opportunity for other people, right? Because my thing that I would love to accomplish is showing that you can have this, what I deem as a massive success without it coming at the cost of so much. My first, first, first music experience, like, I don't know, I think I was kind of I mean, I was, I was brought up in it in the sense of my dad um, was a, is a photographer and started doing that. Like he was shooting for like Cream Magazine when he was 17. So way, way before, you know, I was ever around. Blue Oyster Cult, Utopia, David Bowie, uh, Iggy Pop. And then he started to develop this like, because maybe of his photography eye and things like that, where he would design he did a couple, like, there's a group called Anthrax that he did their album cover. He started doing t-shirt merch designs for groups and then went on the road when he was 19 and was on the road for eight years probably with different, with different artists. But mainly there was an artist named Todd Rundgren that he became personally really close with. And Todd did like, hello, it's me and bang on the drum all day and can we still be friends? I mean, he's, he's had a pretty legendary career, but um, my dad was out on the road with him for almost a decade doing photography and all handling all the merch. But this was when they were doing like arenas. So this was like my dad, now it's crazy because all the stuff we think, me and my brother think we're doing, like my dad's been there and he's done it. And their friends are musicians. Like, and uh, my mom is a clothing designer and she's done like clothes for all these, you know, uh, but Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney and like all these sort of like rock and rollers, these older rock and rollers. And she does um, like hand stuff, like custom hand stuff. So whatever people come to her for their stage outfits sometimes. And that was from, Fitting. yeah. And, and whatever they want, like as wild, they pick certain fabrics they like that they weird design, like really rock and roll ish type things. And um, she doesn't do that as much anymore just because she doesn't have to, but like that was always around us. So uh, yeah, me and my brother now, we have our own independent label and we found the right distribution partner for that. And we are, yeah, we've, we've signed. So mainly we found these amazing producers from all over the world. Like, and I feel like the producers never really get the protection or the love that they deserve, especially in, in rap music. They're, they don't get anything really. And no one really f shows how important they are to what is currently going on. So we have a bunch of these people on our team sesh, our sesh collective, our team, our roster, because of my relationship 
with our distribution partner and found in the right one, we're allowed to do what we want, how we want, because we have proven that we know our fan base. Again, we do our own merchandise. Let's, that's a very huge, we, we don't have a company that does it. We do our own merchandise. We don't have a PR team. We do not pay a publicist. We do not pay a booking agent. We, do, we have no you know, marketing team at all. We are the marketing team. We, are, we make our posts. Um, there's ways to go about all of this, even with working with friends or family. Like I'm, I have this weird thing about trying to prove to people that it doesn't have to be the standard that it's always been in anything. And I want to prove you wrong that all the things you say can't be done I want to figure out a way to go, well, you would have never known. Like the Wizard of Oz thing. Like you pull them behind the curtain and it's literally just a guy doing this thing. So like what? I want to continue to build this thing with my brother that we've built that has now allowed us to live this life that is, you know, beyond like anything we could have expected except it sounds weird but I totally envisioned it or else I wouldn't have spent the time well I want to provide opportunity and again that we've went through these like we've like trudged, trudged through the snow where we've made these marks now you don't have to work as hard because I'm going to tell you what we've done doesn't mean that it is the only way to do it but I feel like we've went a roundabout way to still get here. Look where, we're, look where we're at. My brother is a huge success and we've done things our own way without any really compromise because we were willing to. We were totally willing to do the work. And that's what I, so when we have people come to like VU, for example, I wanna go just have the guts to, do, to, to take a swing because there is an alternative. Right? Like it blows my mind when I say things that are common sense to me now and someone go, Oh my, I didn't even think about that. I'm like, Oh, oh man, like I need, everyone has to know this stuff. You're telling me you don't know. Yeah. That's a, uh, yeah.